Welcome to Pieces of China, uh, which is a series that tells the story of China one object at a time. I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the director of programs at China Institute, and we are so delighted today to have with us Julius Lovell, Lovell, who is an expert on contemporary Chinese politics. She recently wrote a book about Maoism around the world, um, but is a wonderful translator also, who has recently published a new and very highly acclaimed new translation of the great Chinese classic, Journey to the West, which features the most famous character, probably the most famous character in all of Chinese literature, the Monkey King. Um, so um, Julia, let's jump right into it since time is limited. Um, firstly, welcome, so happy to have you with us today. Thanks so much for having me, it's a real pleasure. It's great, and you're calling in from London, which is which is a thrill too, since we can't actually travel. It's great to have you join us. Um, Let's start with the basics for everyone in the audience who doesn't know. First, who is the Monkey King? Okay, uh, the Monkey King um, or Mei Ho Wang, um, also known as Sun Wukong, is the hero of Journey to the West, Xi Yu Ji, um, which as you say, is one of the masterworks of pre 20th century Chinese fiction. So one of its qi shu. Uh, Sun Wukong is a magic monkey. Um, he has superpowers like he can travel 108,000 miles in one leap or he can transform himself into anything he likes and he's also unbeatable at kung fu. But he is mischievous, arrogant and totally lacking in self-control and he quickly, quite early on in the book, gets into a huge fight with the Jade Emperor, ruler of the Taoist heaven, by guzzling all the immortal peaches, wine and elixirs reserved for a massive heavenly banquet. Eventually, after several enormous battles, um, the Buddha from India is called in to help out the Jade Emperor. And the Buddha punishes Monkey by imprisoning him under a mountain for 500 years. After which Monkey Sun Wukong is released to protect a Chinese monk, uh, Tripitaka, on a dangerous pilgrimage to India to collect Buddhist scriptures and to bring them back to China. Um, so they need to overcome multiple monsters, rivers and mountains. The band of travellers includes Monkey, Tripitaka and two other fallen immortals who are also chosen as pilgrims to redeem their sins. And after all these terrible trials and challenges, the band of pilgrims reach India. They deliver the sutras back to China then become immortals in the Buddha's monastery. So among many other things, the novel traces Monkey's journey from troublemaker to virtuous Buddhist. Interesting, okay. So I guess the, the big question is why should we read Monkey King? Um, you know, do, is, it, is it important to know Monkey King and know the story of Monkey King to understand China today? Well, I have, a serious and perhaps a not so serious answer to this question of, of, of why read Monkey King. I'll give you the serious answer first. Um, I'd argue that in the Anglophone world, everyone needs to engage seriously with China and not just with its political system or economy, but also with its enormously rich language and culture. You know, the average educated Chinese person knows so much more about Anglophone culture than can be said in reverse. Journey to the West or, or Monkey King, as it's titled in my translation, is hugely beloved of audiences, not just in China, but across East Asia and the global Chinese diaspora, who are very familiar with its characters and stories. And through reading Journey to the West, you can learn so much about Chinese politics, culture, society, and religion. And I think the book kicks against uh, lazy cliches about Chinese culture that you can still encounter in the West. Cliches, for example, about Chinese culture, worshiping hierarchy and authority, or being isolated from the world outside its borders. My less serious answer about why you should read Journey to the West is that it's an action-packed, 
kung fu rich situation comedy. It features a hero, uh, the Monkey King, of unstoppable sassiness and a cast of delightfully absurd supporting characters. So there's a power napping pig demon, uh, a Buddhist goddess of mercy who loves to make life difficult. There are Confucian monsters and bureaucratic dragons. So it's enormously enjoyable, hugely fun. And I, I just loved every moment of working on this translation. I loved your um, description of how this, this really challenges lazy cliches and the idea that, um, you know, we think of China as being hierarchical and, and you know, obedi an obedient society, this kind of thing. And of course, you've got Monkey King, who's just this rambunctious, uh, you know, mischievous character. It's just fascinating. So, so how important are these books in China today? How important is this book in China today? Are people still reading it? Um, my understanding, you were saying that Mao loved this monkey character. Um, tell us about that and, and how, and do people still read it today? Sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the characters and stories are still a huge influence on Chinese and Sinophone culture. They're a crucial imaginative resource for Chinese readers today, as they were back in the early modern period uh, when the novel came into existence um, uh, in its current hundred chapter form. But I'd also emphasize that it, I'd also emphasize that it's a novel that's passed on through the ages through new interpretations and adaptations, um, as well as in its original form. So it's a novel about shape shifting that has itself shapeshifted so and the novel has changed in different retellings of it so as i say the 100 chapter version that i translated from um it was first published in 1592 and this sprang from much older oral versions of the story and over the past five centuries dozens of adaptations have appeared um, across print theater uh, film music dance um, and even in recent decades video games and chinese people probably more often access the novel stories and characters through these adaptations than through the original 1592 text which 19, is in, 1952 right 1952 uh, no, 50, 1592 so the original text is 1592 <laughs> and it's it's a uh, it's enormously long the original and okay. written in a pre-modern vernacular that's a long way from contemporary chinese uh, so mao mao Zedong himself um was one of the book's many chinese fans he had a lifelong um, uh, uh, reverence for Sun Wukong, the Monkey King character, as a mischief maker. In fact, Mao was even reading the book on the eve of the Cultural Revolution in the spring summer of 1966 um, and saying that China needs more, Sun Wukong needs more Monkey King. So he specifically evoked the uh, example, the model of the Monkey King as a troublemaker to mobilize young Chinese people against his own Chinese Communist Party in the 1960s. But sort of moving away from sort of Mao's authoritarian uses of the book, um, it's again been reinvented and reimagined many times since then. So as I was working on the translation, I was struck by one observation by an internet commentator in 2015, who said that every Chinese people will fall in love with monkey. Each generation has its own monkey, um, and I would add possibly has multiple monkeys. So it's a very open text that's been that, that lives on through adaptation and reimagination wow wow okay so show us i think i got confused because you were saying that there is a version that you which we, you worked with which was from 1952 is that right so 1954 so this is the version which i translated from. So this yeah. is the Soja Chuban the writer's publishing house version, um, a, a, a very authoritative, reliable version, which was put together in 1954. And this date might strike people who are familiar with the Maoist period as a bit odd, because it's well known that after the success of the communist revolution, many different forms of so-called 
old culture, the yeah. culture of the old society, Zhou uh, Shihui, um, could fall under suspicion. But Journey to the West, even though it was um, half a millennium old by that point, seems to have been exempted from Mao's cultural dragnet. I think because you know, Mao had this very personal fondness for the book, fondness for monkey as a figure symbolizing rebe rebellion and revolution. But the story was also changed by Mao um, in the 1950s and 60s. So the ending of the prologue in the real book ends with uh, monkey being defeated by heaven and the Buddha and being punished for his transgressions. But in Mao's ending in the 1950s and 1960s, um, that's completely turned on its head. So, so Kong, the Monkey King, is in fact victorious against the conservative establishment of the Jade Emperor in heaven. So it's quite easy to see how this reshaping of the story could be read as a um, confirmation of Mao's philosophy of popular rebellion against the establishment. Right. And what was the experience of translating it like? Um, you took this massive massive text and managed to cut it down to a text of a single volume. Um, how, tell us a little bit about what the challenges were. Yeah, first of all, I, I love doing the translation. It was such a privilege to interact so closely with this classic of pre-modern vernacular fiction. I loved spending time with the book's main characters. Even though they're supernatural beings, they are so very relatably flawed and fallible. But it was certainly challenging working between two literary cultures that are so remote chronologically and geographically. Um, it was also challenging making decisions about how to reduce the original to about a quarter of its length. So I approached this task in a few ways. I read the whole book in the original and noted which episodes I liked best, which episodes highlighted the most interesting and important and compelling themes and situations. And the structure of the book lends itself to that kind of abridgment because the journey to India is told as a series of episodic challenges or encounters. And very few of these recapitulate stories or encounters from uh, earlier in the book. There's also a certain amount of repetition within the stories. For example, there's, there's an awful lot of man-eating demons and not every single instance needs to be included to convey a general sense of mortal danger. <laughs> but I also compressed some of the language in individual chapters so there was more room for individual episodes. Um, so, for example, the, the Chinese novel has its origins in oral storytelling and it often recapitulates elements of the story so far as if it's being told by a storyteller in the marketplace who's worried that listeners might have wandered off between scenes or forgotten key plot details. So I left out those repetitions as I didn't feel that they were required in a written uh, version of the book. But also really importantly, I consulted Chinese friends either scholars of the book or those who have grown up with the book to ask them which um, in their view were the key classic episodes that had to be included because it was very important to me to include the elements of the novel that were best loved by Sinophone audiences. Fantastic. Um, do you have a favourite episode in the story? I do love the, 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 the prologue in which Monkey gets himself into such terrible trouble in heaven. He completely fails to think through the consequences of gobbling all the immortal peaches, wines and elixirs. I also love the way this prologue tells us so much about Chinese Taoist ideas of spirituality and the afterlife, namely that they will exactly resemble the bureaucratic structures of earthly government. It's this wonderfully amusing and revealing idea that if you become an, an immortal and got to heaven, what could be more heavenly than becoming an official or a civil servant? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, wow, Julia, you are incredible and so well-spoken. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us um, and encourage everybody in the audience to throw away the cliches 
and dive into this 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 translation has been very highly acclaimed um, in particular because it's you've really drawn out the humor uh, in the in the storytelling as well. So I encourage um, everybody to read it. And uh, thank you again so much for helping us tell the story of China. Um, we I also want to just mention that we've got some other programs coming up very soon, which will be very wonderful. Next uh, Wednesday, we have um, a story about what we're calling architectural acupuncture, which features a Chinese architect named Xu Tian Tian talking about a really groundbreaking project she's worked on in Zhejiang province um, in which she uses architecture, modern architecture to help revive these sort of dying villages. So please do join us for that. And, um, and I also wanna encourage you all to become members of China Institute. Uh, your membership allows us to bring wonderful speakers like Julia Lovell to our screens and to our stage in the future. So um, again, thank you for joining. Julia, we hope to get you back again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful questions. Talk soon. Bye.